Okay, so let's talk about the land contract here. We're going to go through this, not paragraph by paragraph, but we're just going to give you the highlights of all these. So if you have any questions, you can stop and rewind this and kind of go back and forth through it, okay? So, all right. So let's take a look. All right, so section one. All right, so the buyer, pretty much what we're talking about, obviously, is the buyer, the seller, and the seller's name, or as identified in section 9C. So if you don't know who the seller is, uh, then you can certainly just click that box there. The listing agent will type in later who the person is. Now, basically what this is, is just saying that you're going to go ahead and buy the property uh, just like any other contract, you know, the property address, the zoning. You should be able to go ahead and find that on uh, the property records down at the courthouse or the CRS records, the assessor's records, number, T, you know, all the legal descriptions. The full purchase price, okay, so in this particular circumstance, I think what we're talking about if I'm not mistaken, there's a guy talking about offering 1500 or something like that. Is that right? Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to turn the phone off real quick here. All right. Okay. So what we what we would do is we would just simply write in 1500. Let's say is the or full purchase price. He's going to put down $500 earnest money. You would want to write to be applied. Okay. To be applied towards buyer closing costs and this would go for pretty much any contract okay buyer closing costs and prepaids okay and prepaids and the reason why is because when they get their prepaids in there you know it's always a good idea to have this adapted to where you can use it there if you need to okay it doesn't have to be but it's always nice to have the option and in this case it'd be a thousand dollars okay cash at close of escrow okay all right cool all right so now we got that and right, i'm going to put this on a bigger screen so you can see it right there if you need to okay all right so the incidental improvements all right let me just try and get this over this as best as i can All right, so the incidental improvements, all right, basically what you're saying is this property is basically vacant land, all right, but just in case there's some things on it, all right, like fencing or, you know, uh, you know windmills or something along those lines, they just happen to be there, that they're not guaranteed, that they're just transferred as is, that there's nothing special to it, that's just what it is, okay? Close of escrow is obviously the date that it records, okay? Or, you know, if uh, they're saying, look, if they're, everybody needs to close in time for the clause of escrow to occur on, say, March 29th, 2012, if the escrow company recorder's office is closed on that date, then the close of escrow shall happen the next day that they're open for business, okay? Now, the buyer's going to deliver to the escrow company the cashier's check and all their stuff before time for it to record, all right? So if it's supposed to record on the 29th, then they need to have their money there by the 28th, okay? Or at least early on the 20th so it can record on them, all right? Possession, they don't get anything on that period, of, uh, on that place. Just like a residential contract, they don't get anything until it actually closes, okay? Um, now, remember, whenever you're discussing this contract or any contract with any seller or buyer, emphasize the fact that it's boilerplate language, okay? And that they won't typically question it a lot of times. So if you're saying hey, this is a boilerplate contract, it's no big deal. You know, a lot of times they're not going to fret about it, okay? Any addenda that you have, they go right along on this section. You just go ahead and check it. If it's a cash sale, then which most of them are, go on to section three. But let's just go ahead and pretend that this has some something to do with financing. Financing is kind of hard to do with land right now. You won't see too much of it, okay? But if there is, there is a vacant lot land uh, status report that's separate that goes with this. It's not the same okay so if you're sending over a prequal form keep in mind that there's also one for vacant lots that's different okay and you can find that on um, zip forms okay financing obviously it's just like a house you know if it's contingent upon them getting uh, something else like in this case this is contingent upon them getting the financing commitment all right uh, the financing commitment uh, contingency period basically says that they got 30 days after you get a contract to go ahead and get this contingency met. They need to get 30, they got 30 days to get their their, their uh, 
their financing. Now, <clears throat> if they get that, great. If they don't, then the buyer can cancel that before the 30th day and get their earnest money back. All right? But they have to do it prior, okay, that to this 30th day. All right? If they do it on day 31, well, that's too bad. They don't get their money back. And that's in bold right here. Okay? So is that saying that you can take a buyer and get a house that they like and then put a, put fill out a contract and then they have 30 days? Well, on the vacant land. Only on, vacant on land. vacant land, okay, they have 30 days. The difference between this and residential is residential, you know, it can be any period of time, all right, that you write up, but the standard boilerplate language is not in here for the 30 days. It's assuming on a regular house, it can be up until the day, practically. And depending on the circumstances, it can be up until the day that it records. Wouldn't so, for example, if I go out and I buy your house, okay, and I put a financing contingency in there. Let's say it's supposed to close April 29th, all right, or April 30th, which is a Monday. April 30th comes along, they, they do my final verification of employment or the verification of credit. And they say, hey, Carl went out and bought a car two days ago, and his debt-to-income ratio is over the limit. All right? Sorry, we can't give him the loan. Well, then I would get my earnest money back. Okay? In this, all right, the difference is they've got a 30-day period. It's not outlined that way in a regular contract. In a residential sale, it's not outlined that way. Okay, so that's not saying you can't enter into a contract. First, you do have to have a loan status report. Well, no, no, because it's a loan status report. Remember, the loan status report here on the vacant land, all right, they're saying that it's attached. You see here on the line 32, it says that it's attached. On the residential contract, it says that you have to provide it within five days. It's either attached or you'll provide it. In this case, it's assumed that it is attached and that you have 30 days. That's the difference here, okay? So if I was to explain that to someone, we, you know, we had, because we do that, that's like our policy. Well, basically what you have to do to explain it to people is you just simply say, look, here's the deal. We got to get you, you know, uh, uh, a pre-qualification, okay? And it has to be on a special form, all right, for land, all right, if they're going to finance this, because financing land is definitely harder, okay? So the lender, you provide the lender, the vacant land uh, loan status report, they'll fill it out, all right, and then you have to have that along with your offer to submit on vacant land. On a house, you don't have to have it. You can submit an offer without it, okay? But that's, is that a good idea? No, it's not a good idea, but it can be done. In this case, you can, you can literally, you could submit a land contract without this too, but it's assuming that the contract itself says that you have it, so you, you know, you should have it. Okay. And then, but either way, here's the okay. here, here's the thing. Okay, let's move on. See if I can answer your question a little bit further. Okay. Now, the thing is that in this, all right, basically is saying that that they have 30 days or blank period of days after contract acceptance for this financing, because land financing takes so long, it can take longer, and they they put an automatic time period in here, 30 days. But if you need more time, you've got to make sure you write that in there or get an extension. But here's the thing. 43 on the financing application, it says that within 10 days, okay, they're, they're going to go ahead and submit a formal application, all right, and that everybody agrees to go ahead and give the lender, the lender, uh, the buyer agrees to give the lender the, the, the documents that they need. On a residential contract, I believe it's five days, okay. Appraisal. Um, it has to meet the appraisal, okay, obviously just like a house. Loan costs, if the buyer wants the seller to pay any of their loan costs, that's where they would put them. Things like, you know, points or Alta policies. Alta policies is American Land Title Association's lender policy. That is for their lender. If they wanted the title policy for their lender to be paid for by the seller, then this is where they would ask for it, okay? Now, uh, let's see, partial release, okay. Now, if there was any kind of partial release, um, Partial releases are things like if they had a, an existing loan where they get a partial release on it or something like that. That's very, very rare. Subordination, if a seller was going to carry back the, the paper, 
then like if I'm getting a first loan, you know, um, let's say the whole property is $100,000 and I'm going to um, get a loan for 50, yeah. okay? Then the seller is saying, hey, I'll carry back the other 50 and it is subordinated, second place, to a construction loan or what other type of loan I have. But it puts it in bold here, if the seller subordinates that, they have to understand that they are responsible for protecting that, okay? So escrow. And you can do that through the title company. Uh-huh, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's, yeah. and you can make those arrangements through the title that's, company. That's right, okay. yeah. Escrow, okay, so escrow, in this particular circumstance, you just hold up, you know, wherever you escrow. Um, I like, you know, Melanie Hestekin or, or Kim Henry, either one. Uh, title investing, let the buyer determine title, okay? You remember how you got joint rights, you know, joint tenants with rights of survivorship, tenants in common, all the different ways you can hold title, okay? That's what they need to figure out with the title officer and their attorney. The title commitment, this is just instructions to the title company to go ahead and get uh, the title insurance together, all right? And that, they have to go ahead and provide a title commitment within 15 days after the contract acceptance, okay? Now, the buyer has five days after getting that to review it and make sure that there's no crazy easements or anything like that on there. And that typically the seller, Line 77, is going to convey it by general warranty deed. That's what most people get, unless it was like a foreclosure. And in that case, it would be a special warranty deed. Now, the difference is general warranty deed says, okay, from time immemorial until this day, we cover the title. That's what the title company is saying. We, we have insurance that will cover it from the dawn of time until today. That's general. Special warranty deed is only for the time that the previous seller had it. And that's why like banks and stuff will issue out special warranty deeds. Okay? So instead of like that home has been your in your that land has been in your family for years. I buy it from you with a general warranty deed. The title insurance company goes through and they say, "Okay, we can see that he's had it in the family for 150 years." So we will go ahead and warranty that, that there's no crazy ants in the history that says it's theirs or whatever. Okay. If you got foreclosed on, okay, the bank that took over that, they don't know any of that stuff from before. They didn't really get title insurance because they foreclosed on it. So what they're saying is, okay, from the time that we purchased it until this day, okay, we'll give the title insurance. That's what special warranty needs are. All right. So additional instructions. Okay. Basically, these are the rules of the game. Additional instructions. Basically, what that is is just letter to the escrow company instructing them to go ahead and get all the title insurance together, all the closing documents together, hold the, the paper, hold the escrow, all that stuff, get everything you need to modify, go down and record it down at the courthouse. It's just general instructions. Prorations, they're talking about taxes, insurance, all of these things uh, that are going to be prorated through the date of closing. Okay? And if there's any deposits held by the seller, line 97, like if they lease the, lot, the property out to a farmer or something, then they would be paid to the buyer at the seller or they would be credited against the cash that the buyer is given. So, for example, all right, you got farmland out in Marana, okay? And the guy leases out part of that land to the neighbor so he can farm cotton, okay? And for that, he gets a thousand bucks a month or a year or whatever he's going to pay all the deposits that he has from that guy to you at close of escrow or okay he's going to go ahead and credit it against the cash required of the buyer so if the buyer's got to come up with five thousand dollars to cash to close then the buyer the seller can say okay well hey that's cool don't worry about it I'll pay you know the three grand that this guy owes me I'll kick in it and you only have to come up with two Makes sense? Makes sense. Okay. Post-closing. Now, because this is land, it is, it is sometimes a little bit, sometimes things can get to where they're unknowns. Like, you know, there might be a, a I'm trying to think of a good example. You know, something that would be not determined, like, like a survey or, or something like that that came up after the fact then, you know, they, all the people are agreeing that they will go ahead and they'll take care of it after close of escrow. Something small, okay? The release of the earnest money. Well, 
Yeah. Like if somebody came out and rezoned, or not rezoned, that all of a sudden it wasn't, but now it is a flood plain. Well, no, in that case, it's that's that's not post closing matters. This is that would be something that would be during the buyer's inspection period. And if it's after the fact, they go out, they during the inspection period, they check out the property. It's not in a flood zone. They close. Two weeks later, FEMA comes out, changes the zoning. Tough shit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is the, that would be this one's that, different. That's right. That's different. Post closing matter, closing closing matters is just simply talking about, um, simply talking about, uh, you know, small items that nobody really could have foreseen, you know. Um, release of the earnest money. Okay, just like a house, you know, the earnest money is held by the title company, and that they will hold the earnest money in accordance with the contract. If there's, if it's clearly a violation of the contract, then it goes to the seller. If it's something that is clearly uh, belongs to the buyer, then it goes back to the buyer. Uh, if it's any kind of question about it, then they hold on to it. Okay. Insurance. The buyer will assure that they go ahead and get their own insurance and that they release you from any obligation for getting insurance. Okay. Any assessments. You always want to put down here that it's paid in full by the seller. Okay. Right. Most of the time, there are no assault, no assessments. But if you're acting as a buyer's agent, this is always a good thing to hit, simply because you want the seller to pay for it. And now, if it was like in the city, okay, and you had street lights or something like that, there was a, a an ongoing share type of thing, then the seller is probably going to say, "Hey, look, we want you to prorate it and assume it." You know, uh, something like that. That's that's typically pretty rare. IRS and fructive reporting. Basically what that is, is saying that if the seller is a foreign person or a non-resident alien, that the seller, okay, may end up having to withhold a tax of 10% unless they have some kind of exemption. This was put in in the 80s for when the Japanese were buying up all of America, so to speak. You may remember that. You know, they started passing those sorts of laws. Now, if the seller is a foreign person, okay, which in this case on Beth it's not, uh, then you know the seller may have to hold back some of their money. Agricultural Foreign Investment Disclosure Act, basically saying that if they were farmers of some kind, you know they would need to go ahead and make any kind of disclosures to the Department of Agriculture if they're going to farm. Tax deferred exchanges, uh, you know 1031 exchanges. You know obviously that's something that's a little bit different. Basically what that is is a tax deferred exchange of property. So if I have vacant land that's a subdivision and I want to sell it, but I don't want to get taxed on it, then I use the tax deferred exchange program, the 1031 in the IRS code, uh, to avoid paying taxes at the moment. At the moment, not avoid, but defer the taxes. Okay. All of this stuff is pretty arcane. You you're probably not going to have to worry about this for most of your career. But the vacant land lot seller property disclosure statement is just the spuds. Okay that you would get except in this case it's specific to land all right any other kind of disclosures now if they know anything that's separate because land is such an unknown this is why we charge 10 percent okay because land itself is a big unknown they can have all kinds of things like you know uh special assessments that are coming associates uh, i'm sorry association fees financial statements rent rolls survey if they got one all these different things they're saying, hey, look, we'll give it to the buyer within five days if we have it. Okay. Generally speaking, you know, they'll 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 not have anything. Now, the other thing with land that's a little bit different is the road maintenance agreement. Okay. Now, a road maintenance agreement, if you have a, a, a lot of land out in the middle of somewhere, then you gotta show that you can get an ambulance out there if somebody's having a heart attack. All right. And a road maintenance agreement. Typically, is just something if it's if it's in an unincorporated area or it has uh, a county road. I mean, sorry, a road that's not maintained by the county. Then they're going to want to have something in there that simply says, "Hey, you know, this land is served, you know, by this section here, and it's got a road to it right here. And this land is not, you know, this road is not served by the county, but." We have a company that comes out and grates the road, and we have legal access to our property and legal access out of our property so that if somebody needs to get in, they can get in. Okay? All right, so the seller's obligations regarding wells. All right? If there's a well, all right, then the, there's a domestic water well attachment that goes to this. Okay? And they go ahead and they assign any water rights or claims to the water rights 
that the seller has that are associated to the property. Water rights are a big thing in Arizona, okay, especially in some of these outlying farmlands, all right? So if they have a well, then they have a, a certificate that they have to provide by the state that, that shows the performance of the well. Okay, so they're also saying, hey, look, no seller or tenant bankruptcy or insolvency proceedings. The seller is saying, hey, look, yeah, I'm cool. I'm not getting foreclosed on or anything like that. And if I am, then I have to let you know. And the reason why that's important is so you can't go buy property that is being foreclosed on or probate or anything like that. Seller notice of violations. This is a huge thing for sellers. They want to make sure the sellers understand there's a lot of things that they have to know, okay? That if you have any kind of violations, okay, building, zoning, fire, health code, zone, anything like that, you got to let us know right away, There's all right? No knowledge. Yeah, you, you, can't, you, you can't be holding back. I mean, you got to let everything hang out. Environmentally, if you know, you know, if you went out there and, and had, uh, you know, treatment or, or, or waste disposal or underground storage tanks or something like that, then you need to let people know that too, all right? Because remember... Arizona and wildcat land subdividing and stuff, they had so many crazy things going on with land that that's why they started implementing a lot of these disclosures is because people would go out there and they would create all kinds of havoc in the, in the, in the mess. Affidavit of disclosures, all right, so basically what you're saying here is this is to prevent wildcat subdividing. Now they're saying, okay, look, in this unincorporated area of the county and five or fewer parcels of property other than the subdivided land are being transferred, then you will deliver an, a completed affidavit of disclosure in the form of uh, required no later than five days later, okay? And what this basically means is this is telling them how many times you've chopped that piece of land up, okay? Because that will affect the ability of the buyer to do it if they want to split it off again, okay? Homeowners Association, if it is or isn't, changes. Nobody can change anything, um, if they, if they find out that, you know, hey, by the way, I've discovered I have an underground storage tank, you know, just on the east end of my property, or I just discovered a septic tank, or by the way, I've got a swarm of bees that keeps hanging around the backyard, you know, they got to let somebody know, okay? Seller warranties. Now, they're basically saying, okay, if there is a parcel of land that has stuff on it, okay, that they're going to maintain it and they're going to keep it up, they're not going to let it go to, you know, go to waste, all right? And that the seller is going to say, hey, look, I'm telling you everything I know about this, about any latent defects or anything like that, so that you can make a decision, all right, uh, that is, is, is a good decision. And I'm also saying that I will make any payments to anybody for any services within the 150 days immediately preceding the close of escrow. So if I needed to go out and dig a septic tank, let's say, all right, and I said, all right, uh, you know, to Affordable Septic, Jeremy, go out and milk, make me a make me a, uh, a septic tank on this property, and they go out and they spend three thousand bucks to do it. They send me the bill, we close. I don't pay the bill. Jeremy and them are going to put a lien on the property, okay? Because they have the septic tank on there. And their seller is saying, look, for five months prior to closing, if anybody comes along with a bill for five months prior to closing. I will make sure it gets paid, okay? Because that's the statute of limitations on that. Post, prior to closing. prior to prior to close of escrow, okay? Prior to the close of escrow, so for five months, that's the statute of limitations, okay? And that means if the clo what if the closing date is tomorrow? It doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter if the thing closes thirty days from now. In five months prior to the close of days of escrow. They're responsible for that. They're responsible that's for right. the five months prior to that, okay? okay? Buyer warrants. They're saying, hey, look, I'm going to let you know anything and everything that could affect my ability to close this contract, okay? And that if for some reason I find out I can't qualify or something else happens, I'm going to let you know about it. And the buyer is also saying that they're not relying on any verbal representations concerning the property except as disclosed as follows. So if you go around and you say, well, guess what? You know, this property has water rights on it. You can sell these water rights for $2 million, Okay. And that's why they're buying this property for $1,500 is because they know they got water rights there. Then that's where that would be written down. Okay. In this case, basically, okay, you're, you're saying, you're saying, I'm not telling you it's, it's, it's on, it's on a gold mine. Right. Okay. The buyer is saying, Hey, I don't, I'm not saying that I believe anybody's ever rich. I'm just buying it because of what I've been told. And this is what I've been told. 
And in this case, this is almost always marked none. Okay? So you always write none in here. All right? Because they should not be relying on anything you tell them. All right? What you see is what you get. All right? Inspection period. Now, on a regular contract, they got 10 days. In a land contract, they have 15. And the reason why is because they not only do they need to do the regular stuff, but they also have to do things like surveys and stuff like that if they want. So you got to give them extra time, okay? Because land, like I said, there's so many unknowns, it's going to take them a little bit more time. So the standard here is 15 days. The next, square footage, of course, if there's a house on it, they need to check it. Check and see if it's in the flood zone. Check and see if it has a septic tank, okay? If it is on a sewer and it's something that's important to them, then they need to check it, make sure they initial there, okay? Site soil evaluations. Now that is not quite... Um, basically what the, the site soil evaluation is for is for um, the septic tank. If they're going to be putting in a septic tank, then it needs to have what's called a perk test. And a perk test is a short word for percolation test, which basically times the amount of time it takes for the water to percolate and to go ahead and get clean. Um, that it is something that they need to evaluate and that uh, if they've already got a septic system in there, they may decide that they do not want to have that done. If they're going to put one in, then they got to decide who's going to pay for it, okay, and when it's going to be done and how much it's going to be, okay. So that's pretty much about all there is to say about that. Land divisions. Now, they need to understand, the buyer needs to understand, not necessarily on this parcel because it's, you know, just one acre, but if they're buying 36 acres or something, that there are laws about that and, and what they can do as far as splitting things up. So they need to understand that when they're making that contract and that they need to check with the municipalities of where they are to decide if that if they're going to be able to split it the way they want to. Or ever. Or ever, right. Roads, um, if it's uh, any roadways, you know, that are not maintained by the county, you know, there's going to be cost on that for road maintenance. And they wanted to figure out, you know, how much that's going to be. If it's going to cost them $500 a, a year to go ahead and maintain that road and have a grader go down and grade it, then they would probably want to know that. If there's going to be a survey, great. Who's going to pay for it? Okay, and how much is it going to be? And it's going to be done during the inspection period. Most of the time, people do not do surveys. Most of the time, they usually go off the plat maps. Okay, but if they are going to do a survey, then the surveyor is going to want to see this copy of the contract as well. And so what you need to do here is have instructions for the surveyor to say, okay, well, we need to know a boundary survey to find out where exactly are the boundaries of the property, which is what most people get if they get a survey, or a survey certified by a licensed uh, surveyor, okay, for the land title uh, association policy, or if you need to know, you know, how far away is the house from the, the side of the property, you know, or whatever, okay? The buyer shall have five days from the receipt of the results um, to go ahead and provide that to the, the seller. This is another way for them to get out of the contract if they need to, okay? So the buyer can say, okay, well, look, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to buy the house. I'm going to buy the land for 1000 bucks, and I'm going to put a survey on there. They're going to do their survey during, during the inspection period, and then once they get that survey back, they got five days after they get that to cancel the contract and still get their earnest money back, okay? Well rights, um, again, you know, if they have wastewater rights or water rights in any way, that's something that they want to, you know, double check and make sure that they have understanding of if that's, if that's something that's important. They also, this is a big block section, they have to understand that you are not a licensed inspector, you're not a surveyor, you're not, you know, anything other Me. than a broker, you're just putting them right. together, okay? Right. Inspection period notice is the same thing as a residential home, okay? In this case, they got after the inspection period, they got to give the notice to the buyer, I'm sorry, the seller, and say what they approve or disapprove of. And then, of course, it's the same time frame. So the seller's got five days to respond. You know, if they're going to do it, then they have to fix it within three days prior to the close of escrow, okay? If they're unwilling to do it, then the buyer can cancel it, you know, that sort of thing. Verbal discussions will not extend the time periods. And then if the buyer fails to go ahead and give the disapproval, then everything's a go, all right? The inspection, the seller grants the buyer the inspection rights to go out and take a look at the property, make sure everything's cool. Remedies, all right. Same thing as a residential contract. The cure period, basically where you're saying here is that um, if the seller or the buyer refuses to close at the time that they're supposed to, 
then the party that's failing to comply, the other party has the right to go ahead and give them what's called a cure notice and say you got three days to make this right. Okay, they can't just cancel the contract. They have three days to make it right. And if at the end of three days that doesn't get solved, then that's called a breach of contract. Then once you have a breach of contract, that's when you can cancel the contract and proceed against the breaching party for any other law or equity thing they have. Uh, basically meaning you can take them to court if it's something that's under $2,500. But if it's over $2,500, then you go to what's called ADR or um, uh, uh, arbitration. Okay. Basically, you know, you go to the arbiter with your side, they go with their side, and the winner wins. Yeah, again, if it's under $2,500, okay, then it goes to small claims court. All right. An example of that would be the guy goes out, does a, uh, the seller goes out and uh, certifies a septic system that's out there, and the buyer flakes out at the last minute and says, nah, it's okay, I don't want it, you know, for no good reason. Then he could take him to court for the cost of the septic certification, which could be three to five, six, seven hundred dollars. Okay. Uh, attorney's fees. If they ever end up going to court for any reason or arbitration, then the loser pays the winner. All right. If there's any additional terms and conditions, uh, that's where you would write them. Do not write there for any reason unless you check with me first. And the reason why is this is known as lawyer land. Anything you write in here in any contract is superseding whatever is written in the regular contract okay so try not to write anything here if you're going to write anything here just write a line right across it okay risk of loss if the ha if the house burns down the, the the land catches fire or whatever then it's still the seller's property unless it exceeds 10 percent of the grace purchase price so in this case is fifteen hundred dollars if the damage on the land is greater than $150, which is 10%, then the buyer can elect to cancel the contract. Short of that, you know, it's still the buyer's property, the seller's property, he's still got to fix it. Permission, they put a sold sign out there. It's governed under Arizona law, not under Tahitian law. And the time is of the essence, that everybody agrees to go ahead and answer everybody in the time frames that we've already talked about, the five days, three days, two days, etc. Compensation. The only reason why anybody's getting paid for any reason, okay, is through uh, the listing agreements, okay, and that commissions, they make sure it's noted in here that all that stuff is all not set by any board, okay. Um, they put that in there so to keep in, to keep in, uh, in compliance with the federal law. Uh, copies and counterparts, copies are just as good as originals. Days, when they're starting to talk about days, is a calendar day that begins at midnight, and ends at 11.59 p.m. Okay, calculating time periods. Basically what they're talking about is the day that something starts, okay, um, is, is, is the day that, you know, it talks about, for the example, the day, like in this case, a great example. For example, acts that must be performed three days prior to the close of escrow date must be performed three full days prior, meaning if the close of escrow date is Friday, then the act, whatever it is you're going to do, like submitting your funds, must be performed by 11.59 p.m. on Monday, meaning you got Tuesday, Tuesday Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, right? And then Friday 8 a.m., you're ready to close. This is the entire agreement, nothing up your sleeve. The seller has the right to take more than one offer, okay, as a backup offer. If it's a short sale, then line 13 of the short sale addendum, line 13 of the short sale addendum lets them know that they can submit more than one offer, okay? In this case, any offer on a regular offer, subsequent, they're all backups. Okay? Cancellations. If somebody wants to cancel it, they have to put it in writing, and they have to state the reason, okay, to the title company. All right? Notice, anytime somebody sends something to you uh, via uh, paperwork, it's just as if they gave it to the seller or vice versa. Okay? It can be sent hand-delivered, fax, email, if they have the email addresses, her in sent by recognized overnight courier, okay, and addressed to the buyer. So for example, if on the last page of the contract, you'll notice where it says email right there. If you don't put your email address there, okay, then they can't email you in copy and say, hey, we can't, we cancel the contract. That's not a recognized form. They have to fax it to you. Okay, let me repeat that. Because fax is a recognized, everybody knows. That's a recognized fax. form of communication. Email is not 
a recognized form of communication unless you put down your email address here. Okay, so if you put your email address down there and they send you a cancellation, then it's valid. Other than that, it's not. So don't, if you get in a situation where you need to cancel a contract with somebody and you email it to them and they want to be, you know, funny about it, they can get out of it and say, no, you never told me. Well, you say, well, I emailed it to you. So, well, too bad. I didn't put my email address on the contract. You're stuck. Okay, so make sure you notice that. Uh, earnest money. The earnest money is in form of a personal check. You never take anything other than personal checks. Okay, they're not written to you. They're written to the escrow company. We do not have a broker trust account. And the release of the brokers. You make sure they understand that, again, I'm not holding a gun to your head. You make your own decisions. You're not relying on lot splits or anything I tell you. you got to investigate everything on your own. We give the seller terms of acceptance. Usually I like to give them two or three days. All right, don't give them, like if it's on a Friday, all right, don't be a jerk and give the selling agent till 8 a.m. Saturday to make a decision. You know, try to give them some time. Just say, hey, look, man, you know, it's cool. Can I get an answer by Monday? You know, because Asians are going to appreciate that, and it'll go a long way. All right. Monday's good. Or Tuesday? Yeah, Monday's cool. Tuesday's cool. You know, Monday is like noon or something like that. Okay. Unless it's a really hot property and you need an answer right away, then then give them some time. Broker, you make sure you put down name and number on there, who you represent, and their signature. Okay. And other than that, that is that. So, hopefully, that'll answer your questions. You take care and have a great, powerful day.